headings we've heard about. Now, the question that is asked here is, is there any prophetic relationship between ISIS, the Pope, and the time of the end? Is there a relationship? Do you think so? Yes. Why, you know they're so. Now, my brothers and sisters, inspiration says something. Very, in fact, take your Bible. Go to 1 Chronicles for a moment. Go to 1 Chronicles 12. Go to 1 Chronicles 12. Before I come back to this ISIS for a moment, go to 1 Chronicles chapter 12. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. A better little stand than this. This stand keeps going up and down. Is there uh, someone who knows about these stands? Is there another stand? 1 Chronicles chapter 12. I want to draw attention here before we go a little bit deeper in our study. We're talking about the, 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 the fact, we're talking about the fact that the deadly wound is almost healed. Do you believe it's almost healed? Yes. But we want to look at it in light of the loud cry. In fact, completely healed, it will be time to give the loud cry. And we're going to show you that from the Bible very carefully and very clearly today. Now, if you're going to 1 Chronicles chapter 12, and when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen. Yes. Let's begin in verse 32. Let's read that. What does this say together? Father, bless these words. We've opened it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Elder. First Chronicles 12, verse 32. What does it say? It says, And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had what? Understanding, Understanding of the times. Now, you and I know that Issachar is one of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Am I right? Yes. We know that Issachar has a relationship to the last days. When you studied Revelation 7, and you look at the chapter on the ceiling, you see that Issachar is one of the tribes that are sealed. So there's something about Issachar that has a relationship to the last days. Am I right or wrong? Now the Bible says that there's something about the characteristic of Issachar. Verse 32. And of the children of Issachar, these were men that had understanding of the... What for? So their understanding of the time put them into a spiritual position that now they knew what to do. do. So if we don't understand the time, we will never know what to do. do. And so if the devil doesn't want us to know, know what to do, what will he try to confuse us on? The time. Now, my brother and sister, in 2015, we don't need to be confused. Do you know that 2015 is a prophetic year? That everything is stacked upon 2015. There are things happening. Listen to the months, and you can write it down. We talked in the school of the prophets and told them something about the fact of June, July, August, and September. Would you say that with me? June, July, August, September. There are prophetic events that cluster around these months. You should write down on your paper June 29 and 30. You should write down on your paper July. You should write it on your paper August, you should write down your paper, September 22 to 27, write it down. There are prophetic events that are centering around this, and if we understand the Bible, we would see the handwriting that is on the wall. Do you want to see the handwriting, yes or no? Now, in June, we're going to show you something that's getting ready to take place with the homosexuality. We talked about this before. We're going to show you something about that. And then, brothers and sisters, that's June. Then in July, we have a general conference session. We're going to show you that it is prophetic that first June and then the general conference comes right on time. We're going to show you that from the Bible a little bit later on. Then August, we jump over that. And then September, we know that the Pope of, Mer uh, of Rome is coming to America. Am I right? Yes. Now, my brothers and sisters, you better understand. All things, when we understand it properly, are telling us we're living in the last few months of this earth's history. And if ever we're going to get ready... We've got to get ready, not tomorrow. We've got to get ready when? Yeah. Now. Now. And whatever it takes, we want to do it. Now, time regulates everything we do. I mean, think of it. The Bible says to everything there's a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. That means that the whole seven-day Adventist message is based on time. The Bible says, fear God and give what? Glory to him for the that's time. For the hour of his judgment is what? Come. So the whole thing is based on time. Jesus himself, when he came preaching, he came preaching, the time is fulfilled. Now, my brothers and sisters, we've got to understand time. Jesus says that if we don't understand the time, that we are going to be lost. And God wants us to be saved. I'm going to tell you something. If you're in this room today, 
Don't let anybody distract you from what we're going to study. If somebody's talking to you, just tell them to be quiet. Amen? Amen. You didn't come to Mentone to talk. You can talk all the way out in California, anywhere you want to go. But in this room, you want to listen to Jesus. Amen? Amen? We want to hear what God is saying. Now, Revelation 13. Let's turn there. Revelation 13. Hold your thumb there. Revelation 13. Now, we said this question is raised. In recent weeks, we have seen the development of a crisis that is fulfilling Bible prophecy. Presently, the media has been filled with pictures of a militant terrorist group called ISIS. Where is it headed? The murders, the beheadings, the great atrocities. I mean, you, you hear about these atrocities. Fingers cutting off, heads cutting off, and they don't spare not only the adults, but even little girls and little children. They are brutally murdered. I'm going to tell you something. This is getting ready to be Seventh-day Adventists. We're not ready for this. This says... How will these type of tragedies be brought to a heart? I'm going to tell you, listen, do you think that if we just bring our children to church and just let them, we just throw toys on the ground, let them play with the toys, that's going to get You think Sesame Street is going to tell them about a crisis? You think that all of these things that the devil has concocted is going to prepare us for this? I'm telling you something, we've got to get back to the Bible. We've got to get back to this relationship with Jesus so that through this crisis we can go through it. Now, the prophet is going to tell us something in a moment. It says, how will these type of tragedies be brought to a halt? Will we see another world war? What's going to take place? Now, notice what the prophet says. Volume 7, page 182. And I wrote that, but now listen to what the prophet says. This is the important thing. Volume 7, 182. Let's read this together. What does it say? It says, the world is what? Filled with what? Storm and war and variance. Three things. Let's say it together. What is the world filled with? Storm and war and variance it says the world is filled with storm and war and variance yet under how many heads one, one head not two heads but how many heads one, one heads how many heads one. one it says under one head the papal power so who is who is the one head the papal power it says yet under one head the papal power the people will unite to oppose god how in the person of his what witnesses this union is cemented by the great apostate. Now, my brothers and sisters, I want to ask you a question. This says that what is going to stop the atrocities? What is going to stop the wars? What is going to stop the terrorism, according to the prophet? What's going to stop it? No, I didn't say us. What did it say? It says the world is filled with storm, war, and variance, yet under what? One head, the papal power, the people unite. What's going to unite the people from the war, the variance, the storm? What's going to unite the people? Talk to me, somebody. The papal power. Does the Bible say that? Does the Bible say that? Listen, everything the prophet says, the Bible says. And everything the Bible says, the prophet says. In fact, in Revelation 13, we looked at it. Revelation 13, verse 3, and we're going to study it today. Revelation 13, verse 3, look what it says. Let's read it together. It says, and I saw what? John says, I don't care what you say, I saw it. I saw one of his heads. Not two, not three, but how many? What did the prophet say? How many heads? It says, I saw one of its heads as it was wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed. And not some of the world. The Bible says in what? What did the prophet say? That the world is going to unite under one head. It says, yet under one head, it says, and all the world wondered after the beast. The Bible and the prophet said the same thing. And my question is, is it taking place right now? Here's the Catholic News Service. Here's the Catholic News Service. It says, Pope Francis is the only leader, not one of the leaders, but what? The only leader respected enough to end today's what? Now, who, who said that first? The prophet did. That tells me that, 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 that Sister White is not the prophet, the plagiarist. That tells me that the Catholic News is the plagiarist. They're copying the prophet. The prophet said over 100 years ago that there's going to be storm and war and variance, yet under one head, the papal power, the people will unite. The Bible said the same thing, and now the Catholic News Service tells us that the world agrees with the prophet. Now, my brothers and sisters, this says, watch now. This is the former Israeli president. Notice what he said. I'm, I'm going to blow it up so you can see it. Let's read this together. It says, Paris, uh, it says, Paris said, Pope Francis would be the best person to do what? Yes. Now, did the Bible say there's going to be one head? 
He said, they'll the, the, be the best person in the head. such a what? That the Bible says it's going to be a world head body. All the world is going to wonder after this head. Now, who's talking? The 91-year-old former two-term president, uh, prime minister of Israel, said he wanted to establish an international body representing the world's major what? Now, watch this now, brothers and sisters. It says, in fact, let me go back, let me back up here. Parents said, Pope Francis will be the best person ahead, such a world body, because perhaps for the first time in what? Has this ever taken place before? It says, the Holy Father, as they call him, is a leader who's respected not just by a lot of people, but also by different what? Religions and their what? Now watch this now. Paris said that the United Nations and his peacekeepers do not have the force and the effectiveness of even one of the Pope's homilies. It says, so given that the United Nations has run its what? Now, what does it mean? Well, you know, the United Nations, if you read the preamble of the United Nations, its charter, it says that they have to come together. The opening charter of the United Nations, it says that they, that they come together to unite the world for peace and security. They're going to stop wars. Has it worked? Has the United Nations worked? Yes or no? No. But this says, the United Nations says, we're going to run its course. It didn't work. But it says, what we need now is a what? An organization not of United Nations, but an organization of what? United religions. Now, my brother says, I wonder what religion they're going to unite under. I wonder if it's going to be the Baptist church. Maybe the Seventh Adventist church. What is going to be the world religion that the, 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 the world thinks is going to stop all of this crisis? It says, what we need is the United Religions, Paris said, as the best way to counteract these what? So he said, what's going to stop ISIS and the militant groups? We need a united world religion, and we believe that the Pope is the only one that can head such a world body. What we need is an unquestionable, it says, uh, uh, what we need is un uh, uh, the best way to counteract these terrorists who kill in the name of their faith. What we need is an unquestionable moral authority who says out loud, no, God doesn't want this, and God doesn't allow this. And they said that perhaps that the Pope is the only one that can do this. I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. They believe that the Catholic Church, and you know what the Catholic means anyway. Catholic means what? Universal. So what would be the universal uh, religion? Catholicism. And the Bible has told us this over 2,000 years ago. And as seven Adventists, we sit in our churches calmly sitting now saying, Oh, I wonder if this is really going to take place. This deadly wound is about to be healed, brothers and sisters. This is why we're told when we saw the Time magazine, when this man came on this scene in 2013, Pope Francis elected and put, in the sits, uh, put on the front cover as the man of the year. From that time, every major world magazine has placed Pope Francis on the front cover. Whether it was rock, whether it was rap, whether it's uh, sports, whether it's gay, it doesn't matter what magazine, he's been there. The world is almost ready. Now, my brothers and sisters, the double issue came in 2013, talking about this very thing, and every seven of should have known this deadly wound is getting ready to be healed. But let me tell you something, when that deadly wound is healed, it's too late to get ready. When that deadly wound is healed, it's going to be time to give the loud cry. And I'm going to tell you something, we are not ready for this. You know, we need to be praying, we need to be praying, dear God, help us. It says, let's read this together. While the Protestant world is by her attitude making concessions to what? Is this going on in 2015? Who invited the Pope of Rome to America? Nancy Pelosi and Boehner. Boner, Boehner, whatever his name is. Both of them Catholic. The Supreme Court, the Senate, the House. This is the first time in history that a Protestant country like America has invited a religious leader, and especially, of all people, the Pope. When America got started in 1776, know your history, it was to get away from the oppression of papacy. When in the 1800s, the papacy gave the block of stone to for the Washington Maya map, they took that block of stone, crushed it up, and threw it into the Potomac River and said, we want nothing of Rome in the United States of America. And today we call him the man of the year. 
Protestant America has changed, brothers and sisters. It says, while the Protestant world is by attitude making concessions to Rome, let us arouse to comprehend. Don't go to sleep. We've got to do now. We've got to do what? Wake up. Let us arouse to comprehend the situation and view the contest before us in its true light. Let the watchmen now not lower their voice, but lift up their voice and give the message, which is what? Present true for this time. Let us show the people where we are and what? We, do you want to know where you are in 2015, yes or no? We're going to show you, brothers and sisters, where we are by the grace of God. And you've got to be ready to study. You ready to study? It says, and seek, once we show where we are, that's not enough. Seek to arouse the spirit of true Protestantism. Awakening the world to a sense of the value of the uh, 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 of privileges of religious liberty so long enjoyed. Let me tell you something. This religious liberty is getting ready to go. It's getting ready to be thrown out of the window. And, and let me tell you something. If we are not taking advantage of our religious liberty now, you know we're not going to take advantage of it then. You know it's a religious liberty to pray when you want to pray. You know it's a religious liberty to study your Bible and the, and, 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 and the freedom right now to come to church like this. But if you have a hard time coming to church now, if you have a hard time exercising the religious, the religious liberty of prayer and the study of the scriptures now, you know that when that crisis breaks, you're not going to do it then. Awakening the world to a sense of the value of the privileges of religious liberty so long enjoyed, God calls upon us to awake for the end is near. I think we need to stop again and pray, dear God, open up our minds. Help us as we get ready to study this last session. You want to say, dear God, give me a Bible, give me a pen, give me a paper, let nothing distract me. I want to understand this because if you understand it, then you can be able to share with somebody else. I'm going to tell you something. You're going to see something tonight that you've never seen. Guys. I've never seen it before in my life, what we get ready to talk about in a few moments. But we're going to walk into it. Amen? Would you reverently kneel with me? Oh, Father, I plead, Lord, that you would lift the spirit of darkness that the devil would try to bring in. That the tired frames and the tired minds that we have abused, may the Holy Spirit give supernatural energy. We're told, dear God, that Jesus in the hours along with God prayed for the power of the Holy Spirit and that his humanity was charged with a heavenly current. Dear God, I plead that you will send that charge down in this room tonight that even sleeping saints would wake up before it is too late. I plead that you'll take control of the feeble equipment, that the, that, that the warmness of this room will not put us to sleep like the warmness of Laodicea. I plead, dear God, that the power of the Holy Spirit would so open up our eyes and our hearts that we would see that our only hope is to run to Jesus. Be with our children, Lord. Don't let them sleep. Be with, be with the young people. Be with the families. Lord, if ever we're going to get ready, it's now. You said gather the children, even those that suck the breast, because the time has come. Please, Lord. Lord, you know that I'm weak, I'm feeble, I'm fickle, I'm frail, I'm ignorant. But dear Lord, you're wise, you're strong, you're mighty. I pray that you'll take this little mind, Lord, and take control so that we can hear and understand before it is too late. May angels walk up and down in this room and remove every distraction. And we thank you. For we ask all of this. In Jesus' name, amen. We want to take our Bibles and turn to the book of Revelation. Revelation, the 18th chapter. Revelation chapter 18. And when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen. amen. Revelation chapter 18. Now, brothers and sisters, I want that seal. You want that seal? Yes. I told you I want that latter rain. Do you want that latter rain? Yes. I told you I want to give the loud cry. Do you want to give the loud cry? You see, sometimes right now, people are looking at the condition of the Seventh-day Adventist church, and they're getting discouraged. They see the drums that the prophets say will take place just before the close of probation, and they get discouraged. They see the jewelry. They see the makeup. They see the apostasy. They see the problems. They see the lowering of the standards. And man today says, could this really be the Seventh-day Adventist church? So, so much so, don't believe it, that some of them are solving the problem by going out and starting their own churches. But I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. I don't care how good that man sounds. 
I don't care how much Bible he gives. I don't care how much spirit of prophecy he says. If he tells you to leave the church, he's of the devil. We're told that enfeebled and effective as it may appear, that the seven heaven his church is the one object in which God bestows his supreme regard. And that if any man touches the church, he touches the apple of the eye of Jesus. You see, I'm not discouraged when I look at the condition of our denomination. Why? Because I know that before us is the dawning of a bright and better day. I understand, brothers and sisters, that the Bible says that if upon this remnant church, that there's going to be a revival and reformation that has not been witnessed since apostolic times. We have been told, brothers and sisters, that, 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 that very soon, that after the shaking takes place, that the Seventh-day Adventist church is going to be brought back into its upright position, and the prophet identifies it in Revelation chapter 18. This is the loud cry. Revelation 18, beginning in verse 1, let's read that together. The Bible says, and after what? These things I saw what? Another angel comes down from heaven. Now, you must understand, brothers and sisters. The Bible says this angel lightens the earth with God's glory. Do you know that the prophet, looking down to the latter rain, loud cry time, said that when the seven dead Venice are brought into that experience with Jesus, that their faces are going to light up. Great controversy says that they're going to go from city to city, from country to country, to remote country places. It says that thousands upon thousands are going to listen. Yea, millions are going to hear the message of God of present truth that they have never heard before. Great Controversy says in the final warning that the sick will be healed. That wonders will follow the believers that everywhere we go, there's going to be a revival. We are told that those who are going to leave the Baptist church and the Catholic church and the Presbyterian church and some that are not even going to church because of the hypocrisy that is in the Seventh Adventist church today. We are told that God is going to bring out these millions and they would have never heard words like these. They are going to hear in amazement that Babylon represents the corrupted church that has fallen because of the rejection of the threefold message of Revelation 14. They are going to hear that church and state is going to unite. They're going to hear the stealthy but rapid progress of the papal power. The prophet says that all of this is going to be unmasked and thousands will listen who have never heard words like this. Do you know we were in Africa just a few weeks ago? Do you know that while we were doing the meeting that they brought a Sunday station to the church and the Sunday station recorded the whole meetings and aired in all their, uh, their Sunday churches? After a few weeks later, they went to the mall, the biggest mall right there in, in that particular place in Kenya. And when they went to that mall, that they played these messages in the public malls and multitudes are listening. I'm going to tell you something. Seven Adventists may be taken uh, carelessly, but you know that God is getting ready to make a loud cry. World's getting ready to be drawn into this movement. And my brothers and sisters, the Bible says that it's going to go like wildfire. Can you imagine, brothers and sisters, what it's going to be like? I want to be a part of it. What do you say? Well, I'm going to tell you something. It's not going to happen in the condition we're in right now. There has got to come a shaking. You know what the loud cry is going to tell the, those in the other churches? I mean, look at it. Look at Revelation 18. When they come down, look at verse 2. Let's read that together. Verse 2, all together. What does it say? It says, and he did what? Crying mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen. It is fallen. And has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Can you imagine how in the world will we be justified when we can go to the churches of Rome, go to the Protestant fallen churches and tell them your church is a habitation of devils if the same devils are in our church? Why we make ourselves look unintelligent? God's not going to let us give the loud cry telling them that their church is the habitation of devils until God has cleaned the devils out of our church. I'm going to tell you something, the majority of true Christians are not in the Seventh Adventist Church today. The majority of true Christians are in the Catholic Church and the Baptist Church and the other churches going to church on Sunday and the greatest devils are right here in the Seventh Adventist Church. Now, I know you don't want me to tell you this, but I've got to tell you the truth. My brothers and sisters, this is why God has got to wake us up and shake us up so that we can wake up before it is too late. Look at what the prophet says. Let's read this together in Spiritual Gifts, page 24. Let's read that together. The prophet says, you believe in the prophet, yes or no? Let's read it together. It says, experimental what? Is known by but a few. The shaking must soon take place. What's that shaking going to do to the church? To purify the church. Preachers should have no scruples to preach the truth as it is found where? In God's what? Word. Let 
the truth do what? And you know the problem is we don't like to be cut. We don't like for someone to tell us the truth. We want someone to tell us that you can come to church and as long as you pay your tithe and you have a position that you're all right. But I'm going to tell you something. It doesn't, make, it doesn't care whether we're pastors or evangelists or teachers or members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The Bible says that some of us will say, Lord, we prophesied in your name. Lord, we've done many wonderful works. And Jesus will say, but I don't know who you are. And can you imagine for us to have been Seventh-day Adventists all our lives, going to prayer meeting, going to church, and yet still Jesus says he doesn't know who we are. And it's and says, let the truth cut. I have been shown that why ministers have not more success is. Now, it's amazing. We have a lot of things which we would say, oh, we don't have church programs. We need contemporary music. We need all that. That's what, what the modern church will say. But that's not what the prophet says. The prophet says, they, talking about the ministers, are afraid of doing what? So when you start talking the straight testimony, then you stop being like. They stop asking you to come to churches. They stop asking and inviting you to come. They say, you know what? The, your message is too straight. They said the same to Elijah. They said the same to John the Baptist. Listen, you don't have a man who stood for truth that wasn't in trouble. Anybody who stands for truth today is going to be in trouble just like in the days of old. Now, my brothers and sisters, this says they are afraid of hurting feelings. Fearful of not being what? Curtis. And as a result, they don't raise the standard. You know what they do? The prophet says as a result, they lower the standard of truth and conceal, if possible, the peculiarity of our faith. What does peculiar mean? Talk to me, somebody. Different. Today, we're trying to show how close we're like every other denomination. But my brothers and sisters, there's a difference between the Seventh-day Adventist church and the rest of Babylon. God has a distinctive difference, and we should show what the difference is from the Bible, from the spirit of prophecy, and manifest it in our lives. Inspiration says... I saw that God could not make what? Successful. The truth must be made what? Pointed. And it's amazing. I don't care how much time you talk. I don't care how, how much truth you have to share. When you start sharing what needs to be shared, someone always says, but you're not tactful. Well, you show me a tact that doesn't have a sharp point. It says the truth must be made pointed. And the necessity of a decision urged. And as false shepherds are crying what? Peace. And are preaching smooth things. It says the servants of God must not whisper, but they must cry aloud and spare not. Well, what if they don't invite you back? Leave the results of God. I'm going to tell you something. I never even think of going to a church more than once. Because I believe. I'm more interested, brothers and sisters, in our salvation than in being considered popular. When you understand the crisis we're in, the moments that we have left, and right now we're hearing almost absolutely nothing from the pulpits. Our pulpits have become mute, brothers and sisters. Who is going to give the trumpet a certain sound? Where is Elijah? That's going to say how long halt ye between two opinions. If God is God, then serve him. But if Baal, then serve him. You cannot be a seven Adventist and a worldling. Yes. There should be a distinction. What do you say? Yes. Now, my brother, I'm going to tell you something. God's not going to bring the millions into the church. You heard what Mason already showed you from the word of God. God's not going to let millions come into this church right now. I mean, think of it. God is practical. Think about it this way. Look at the loud crowd crowd's going to say. Look at verse 4. Verse 4. Revelation 8 go, continues. In Revelation 8 verse 4 it says, And I did what? I heard another voice from heaven. Now notice what the loud cry says. Let's read it together. Saying what? Come out of her devil's people. So God has people in Babylon and other churches. And he says, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. Now I want to ask you a question. If God's loud cry, it's going to bring people out of Babylon, out of the world, and into the seven heavens church, the remnant church, the message of the most holy place. If God is going to do that, do you think he's going to bring them in before he sets his house in order? No. I mean, let's see how practical God is. I mean, think about you. I always like to tell the story. You know, years ago, when you had a real pastor, the pastor wasn't just a pastor in name. The pastor was a shepherd. He used to visit his flock. And the pastor would visit every house. Year by year, every year, he would make rounds to every member of the church. 
Bible just says that's where the pastor should be doing even today. And this is why you can't have a mega church. You have a mega church, how is one pastor going to be able to spend his time going to all the churches? This is the way it can't happen. I know, you know, it was like, you know, years ago, the pastor would come up, and sometimes he didn't tell you it was coming. Sometimes he used to make a surprise visit. Oh, that those days would be revived, brothers and sisters. I can imagine it would be like you sitting at the house and you eating, and all of a sudden, knock him on the door. You send your child to the door, and the child goes to the door, he hears the knock, and the child goes to the door, and he says, Pastor, you say, Pastor! <laughs> you go over to the kitchen, you start wiping off the cornflakes from the table. Picking up the socks and taking all of it. And you know there's one room in the house where nothing is right. And you clean up everything in that one room. You throw everything in and shut the door and say, Pastor, come on in. First, you clean up your house. And then you take guests. Am I right? Now, my brothers and sisters, when that loud cry is getting ready to go into the multitudes and millions are going to come out of the world and all the false churches, they're going to come in to the remnant church. First, God is going to purify and set his house in order before he brings the guests. What do you say? Now, my brother and sister, the prophet says the same thing. Watch. Let's read this together. Volume 6, page 3, 7. Let's read that together. What does it say? It says, the Lord does not. What's the next word? It doesn't mean that he doesn't want to do it, but he does not do it when? Now. It says the Lord does not now work to bring how many? Now, it doesn't say any. It says what? Now, there are a few that God is bringing now. I was talking to a Catholic brother to, uh, that used to be a Catholic uh, brother uh, just a day, uh, a few days ago. And he was telling me that God just brought him in. I've been talking to many than other denominations, few there, few there, and they're saying, you know what? God brought me into this church. Let me tell you something. God is bringing a few in now, but the great majority are not being brought in now. Why? What does it say? It says, God will not bring many souls into the truth because of the church. What's wrong with the church? It says, because the church members, number one, who have what? Never been converted. Is it possible to be in the church and never been converted? Yes, it is. Now, if that's us today, I say, let's go to Jesus. What do you say? But then it says, and number two, those who were once converted, but who have what? Backslid. You, you mean to tell me that you could have once been converted and then today unconverted? We don't believe once saved, always saved? We don't believe once in grace, always in grace? We don't believe once converted, always converted. We believe that it's possible for a man to be converted today and be of the devil tomorrow. Now, my brothers and sisters, that means that this experience that we have must be daily. Daily. Paul says, I die daily. Now, my brothers and sisters, this says, why? What influence would these unconsecrated members have on what? Do you know that a, a new convert just called me about last week, just before we were doing the week before last, just before we came out here, a new convert called me from one of the Midwest, and he called me up. He said, listen, I, I just came to the church. I saw you on YouTube. I used to, he said, my father worked for Billy Graham. And he said, I was heavy into the, uh, into the denomination, the Sunday denomination. But he said, when he got on YouTube, he f somehow came across and found these messages. He said he saw the financial crisis. He saw Revelation, and he said he called, and he said, look, I heard and found out that this was the Seventh-day Adventist message. He said, and I was so excited, I wanted to bring my whole family, get out of the city, into the country, do what God said. And he said, when I came to the Seventh-day Adventist church, because he said first he started going around and started just choosing any place, but then he heard that it was the remnant church of Bible prophecy. Then he came, and he came to the Seventh-day Adventist church. He found one near him, and when he got to the church, you know what he said? He said, the pastor greeted him and said, you know what? He said, look, I finally found a seven Adventist church. He said, I'm excited. He said, I want to get baptized. And he said, do you believe the Lord is coming soon? And the pastor said, what? Coming soon? He said, we have at least another 100 years. The man said to me, he said, look, he said, if I had not heard these messages, I would have said, this is not the Son of Venice church that you preached about. He said, because this is not what I see. He said, what you preach from the Bible is not what I saw when I came to that church. He said, the music, the lifestyle, he said, a family invited him into his house. And they said, come over. He said, they were nice and cordial. He said, but when they sat down at the table, he said, it was just like what you preached about. He said, they brought out KFC. He said, they sat down. He said, they were sitting there eating. He said, what in the, he said if he had not heard the messages, he would have left the seven heaven his church never to come back. He said, but praise God that it's real. Now, I'm not going to ask our sisters, to, don't, don't be distracted. Amen? Amen. Praise God. It says that, that, brothers and sisters, the devil understands. Look what it says. It says, what influence what these unconsecrated members have on what? 
two commas. Would they not make of no effect the God-given message which his people are to bear? You think that God's going to bring millions upon people into this church so that we can live differently and make them think that the message is not real? You think so? No, brothers and sisters. God is going to shake up his church. God is going to prepare us because when that Sunday law is passed, all of those who not, do not have this experience with Jesus are going to be weeded out. But I don't know about you. I want to be grafted in. What do you say? Now, my what I see today is that we have but a few short months to get into this condition with Jesus. Go to 2 Thessalonians. What book did I say? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Notice what the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Now, we're getting ready to study now. We, we led that introduction. Now, we're getting ready to really study. Now, my brothers and sisters, listen to me. One of the greatest problems today is because of this. You know what this is. These are cell phones. This is one of the most common things we see today. It's amazing. Man walks around like he can't use anything else but a cell phone. I always say that today people are calling these smartphones. I don't know if you can call it a smartphone. I mean, think of it. Years ago, before you had this so-called smartphone, you knew your number and your brother's number and your daddy's number and your uncle's number and your family's number. Now you don't even know your own number. And you call it a smartphone. I don't know if you can call it that, but I'll, I'll leave that with you. But here are these two phones. Now, let me say, you know that these so-called smartphones, they allow you, it allow you to get a service plan because in the service plan, if you get one, you can get are uh, texting people and all this so you don't pay much money. Now, when you get a service plan, I want to ask you a question. You want to choose that service plan wisely, am I right? Now, what if all of a sudden another person calls you today, uh, not today, let's say tomorrow, amen, and they call you tomorrow and they say to you, I want you to switch your service plan from the one that you're on now to a new plan. Let's call it John Doe Services, John Doe uh, 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 Internet uh, Telephone Services. Now, question. Would you, be willing to switch your, or would you be willing to switch your service? Well, now, you got to be intelligent. If you're intelligent, you, it depends. That's right. If you're intelligent, what would you ask the man who asked you, do you want to switch your service? You would say, what do you have to offer? If you're intelligent, what do you have to offer? You say, what's your service plan? Now, I'm going to ask you a question. What if he gives you a service plan the same as the one you already have? Do you switch? What if he gives you a service plan worse than the one you already have? Do you, do you switch? Now, my brothers and sisters, it's amazing. We can see that with a cell phone, but we don't necessarily recognize that with the church. I mean, think of it. Right now today, we go to the man who's in the Sunday church, and we come to him, and we tell him we want him to switch service from Sabbath service to Sunday service, but we offer him nothing different. The same diet that's in the Sunday church is in our church. The same dress that's in the Sunday church is in our church. The same music that's in the Sunday church is in our church. The same evangelism that's in the Sunday church is in our church. The same education that's in the Sunday church is in our church. The same problems in marriages that are in the Sunday church or in the, our church. And then we say we want them to come out of their church, change their service from Sabbath, Sunday service to Sabbath service, but we give them no different service plan. My brothers and sisters, we've got to have something different. And in that difference, it must be something better. And we find that better inside the sanctuary. Do you know that in the first, second, and third angel's message, God has given us the most distinctive and greatest truth that has ever been given to mortals? It has been given to us. My brother and sister, Satan's plan is to try to shut down the seventh day Adventist church by this passing of the National Sunday Law. Now listen, if the devil could shut down the seventh day Adventist church by the passing of a National Sunday Law, could we get the seal? Yes or no? No. If there was no one to get the seal, who would receive the latter rain? If we could not receive the latter rain, who would give the loud cry? If there was no loud cry, who would bring the other sheep from other folds into the right place so that when Michael stands up, that his body will be ready to stand with him? No one would be ready. And so the devil says, I must attack this church. And this is 2015. Now watch what the prophet says. Brother Mason, we've been talking about some of this. I'm not going to pass over that. Brother Mason shows you that one, but I want you to see this. Let's read this very carefully. Christ out of the page 412. It says, it is in a what? Crisis. That character is revealed. When the earnest voice proclaimed at what? Now, this is talking about the, this is talking about the 10 virgin parable of Matthew 25. Now, brothers and sisters, there's a historical application that you find in great controversy. There's a prophetic application that we find in Christ out of the heavenly father. There are those in this room that are being distracted by the devil from the front to the back. If there's someone in the overflow, 
Someone upstairs, dear God, do not allow the devil to divert us now when our very salvation is at stake. I plead, dear God, give us more of your spirit in this room tonight. Rebuke the demonic spirit that would not want us to understand where we are. Please, dear God, grant us the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to tell you something. The devil is playing the game of life for every soul in this room. And I don't care where we're up front or up back. Or out, or listen to me. The devil, I know what I was studying. Because when I, when, when I, when I saw this, I, I, I went to my wife and said, wife, I, I, it was early in the morning. And I said, wife, it's over. We're playing, brothers and sisters. Listen to me. It says in a crisis, characters reveal. When the earnest voice proclaimed at midnight, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And the sleeping virgins were aroused from their slumbers. It was seen who had made preparation for the event. Now, why ten virgins? You know why. I won't study with you now because it's not my study. But if you study ten, you'll find out in the Bible that ten is a symbol of completeness. The Ten Commandments is the whole duty of man. So if it's ten virgins, it's talking about the whole church. Now, my brothers and sisters, it says that when the midnight came, how much of the church woke up? The whole church woke up. Elder Mason showed us already this was the Sunday law. Now watch what the prophet says. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go out to meet him. It was seen who had made preparation for the, what was the next word? So whatever this midnight is, the prophet says, it is an event. Then it says, so now, a sudden, unlooked for calamity. Something that will bring the soul face to face with what? What event is getting ready to bring us face to face with death? Talk to me, somebody. Watch this. We'll show whether there's any real faith in the promises of God. It will show whether the soul is sustained by grace. The great, what's that next word? Final test comes. So this midnight is the event. It is also called, the midnight is also called the what? Great final test. And it comes at the close of what? When it will be? So when midnight comes and all the virgins wake up, all the church wakes up, is it going to be time to get ready or is it too late to get ready? So if we can find out what this great final test is, that is the event when the midnight comes and makes it too late for us to get ready. Do you know that over 99% of the Seventh Adventist Church do not know what this midnight is? Look what this says. It says it's coming when it's too late. What is it? The great final test. Question. You know what it is. What is that great final test? Talk to me, somebody. The Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty. For it is this point of truth especially controverted. When the final test shall be brought to bear upon men. When is the Sabbath test coming? When, with the law of the what? So when there is a national Sunday law, the great final test will be brought. It will then be midnight. It will then be too late for a seven-day Adventist to get ready. So the question should be, how near are we to the passing of a national Sunday law? Is that a good question? Now watch this now, brothers and sisters. When that Sunday law is passed, it's too late. Watch. The prophet says, there are many who, of whom he, there are many who have not yet heard the testing truth for this time. There are many with whom the Spirit of God is striving. The time of God's destructive judgments is the time of what? But notice, the mercy is not for everybody this time. It says the time of mercy for not everybody, but for what? Those who have had no opportunity to learn what is... Now tell me something. Who is the ones who have had no opportunity to learn what is true? Is that Seven Adventists? No. Seven Adventists have had opportunity. We have the Bible. We have the Spirit of Prophecy. We have all the books. We have all this, brothers and sisters, we've been warned. But there are many in other churches, sincere Christians, some who even passed the Sunday law, that they don't understand what this means. As Rachel says, tenderly will the Lord look upon them. His heart of mercy is touched for them. His hand is still stretched out to save them. While the door is what? Closed to those who would not enter. My brother says, when that national sun law is passed, 
There are other people who have never heard this message. They will still have opportunity to come in to the most holy place. But Seventh-day Adventists who have heard this for over a hundred years and been warned and warned and warned, when that law is passed, the door will be shut and we're going to be just like those foolish virgins. We're going to come back and we're going to see it's too late to get a character that's right. Somebody's going to say, but I preached about this. I organized this. I developed this. I've gone to church. This is my church. I did. But God is going to say, I don't know who you are. You see, when we come to church, we can put on a good front. We can put on a suit and a tie on. We can do all this. But you know that we're told that many are practicing secret sins in their closets. Fornication and pornography in the church. Adultery, molestation, homosexuality, all these sins going covered up. And our answer is to run to Jesus. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that no matter how many sins I've committed, that there's a plan of redemption. What do you say? Now, my brothers and sisters, this says, but we don't have much time. That door is getting ready to close. That Sunday law is getting ready to be passed. And we have to find out, Lord, how near are we to that? Now go in your Bible to 2 Thessalonians. You should be there now. 2 Thessalonians. We're studying. We're studying the word of God. You there, amen? Yes. Let's pick up in verse 2. We, we, we are familiar with this. We're on safe grounds for familiar grounds. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You ready to study, yes or no? Yes. 2 Thessalonians 2. Beginning in verse 2. Talking about the coming of Jesus. Let's read that together. What does the Bible say? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 2, all together. It says, that ye be what? Not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us. In other words, the Apostle Paul said there were some people that were writing, acting like they were an apostle. They were counterfeiting letters from the Apostle Paul. He said, don't let, he said, don't let the, don't, don't think if you seem to get a letter from us that's different than what we've already told you. It says, or trouble neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Why not, apostle? Verse 3. Let how many? No man deceive you by any means. For that day, that is the second coming of Christ, shall not come except there come a what? A falling away. What's the next word? First. Now, once that falling away, that apostasy takes place, what's going to be the next thing before the coming of Jesus? What's going to take place? What does it say? And that man of sin be what? The son of perdition. Now, please, please, please circle that. Circle that in your Bible. We're studying. Circle in your Bible. So the Bible says that before Jesus comes, you will never see the second coming of Jesus. Don't even think of that you're going to see it until first there's a falling away. Second, the man of sin is going to be what? Who's going to be revealed? The man of sin. Now, give me another name for the man of sin. No, from the Bible. Give me another name for the man of sin. The son of what? Perdition. Now, we know who this is. In fact, the Bible explains who it is in the next verse. What does it say? The next verse says, it says, it's talking about who this man of sin is, who this son of perdition is. Verse 4 says, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. So the Bible says the man of sin has to be revealed. And the way you're going to know him is that this man of sin is going to uh, uh, exalt himself above all that is called God. What else? What else does it say? Or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the what? Temple of God, showing himself that he is what? Now, my brother says, the Bible says then that the man of sin or the son of perdition is a man that will sit in the temple of God and it's a man that would say that he is what? Now, my brother and sisters, you and I know who that man that says he's God is. Are, are we not, am I right or wrong? In fact, go to Isaiah 37. We're going to find out, brothers and sisters, in Isaiah 37, that the Bible says that this man of sin, it says that he exalted himself above all that is called God and sitteth in the temple of God as if he's God. That means whoever this man of sin is, he's going to sit the exact same way that God said that he would sit and he's going to be an antichrist. He's going to be a counterfeit. So what we're going to do in Isaiah 37 is find out how does God sit because the man of sin is going to come pretending to be God and is going to try to sit just as God sits. Look at what the Bible says in Isaiah 37. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Isaiah 37. You follow me, brother, and says, you follow me. Isaiah 37. Notice what it says. 
Isaiah 37, beginning in verse 16. We're looking at how God sits because the man of sin, before Jesus comes, must be revealed. This man of sin is going to claim to be God. He's going to exalt himself above all that is called God. He's going to sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, Isaiah 37 tells us how God sits in his temple. Isaiah 37, beginning in verse 16. Let's read that together. You're there, amen? What does the Bible say in verse 16? It says, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel. Here's God. How does he sit? What does it say? That dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou how? Now, how did God sit according to the Bible? How did he sit? He sits where? He sits between the two cherubims. Now, that's how God sits. Am I right? Now, what kind of cherubims? If you were to go back to Exodus 25, those cherubims are not silver. Those cherubims are what? Gold. Exodus 25 says they're golden cherubims. So the Bible says that only God does this. Of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. Now, my brothers and sisters, there's only one person in the entire world of any religion that has fulfilled this particular text. And we can see where the man of sin is. Watch now. Who is this right here? The Pope of Rome. I want you to notice something for a moment. This is April 14, 2013, but I want you to see this. Now, if you can see this, what do you see on his right side? Cherub. What do you see on his left side? Who do you see sitting in between it? Now, do you know there's no other person, you know, any other religion has ever done this? Now, my brothers and sisters, this is the Catholic Church. Now, if we had time, we can go through Revelation 13, 1 through 10, but you are familiar with that. You know that the beast represents the Roman Catholic Church. Are you with me? But now we need to go a little further. So we can see that clearly this is the man of sin. This is the Roman Catholic church system. But the Bible says that this system will receive a deadly wound. Am I right or wrong? Where does it say that? Let's go to Revelation 13. Let's go in our Bibles. Let's go there quickly. Revelation 13. The Bible says that this man will receive a deadly wound. But then it says that this deadly wound is going to be healed and that all of the world is going to wonder after the... Now, we need to find out how near we to that because when the daily wound is healed, we're going to find out a son-in-law will be here. When the daily wound is healed, we're going to find out it's time to give the loud cry. We're going to find out when the daily wound is healed, we're going to find out it's too late to get ready. And we're going to show you that the daily wound is almost healed. Now, watch this now. Here's the, the Catholic Church. This is Catholic TV. Never in the world have we seen such blasphemous boldness, and yet there are many sincere Christians who have never seen this. But I'm going to tell you, there are sincere Catholics that when they hear this, they take their stand for Jesus. I was in one of the most Catholic countries, and they said, if you speak on the third angel's message, they can put you in jail. I said, they better open up the door and lock the key because I'm going to preach the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth by the grace of God. Amen. Do you know there are sincere Christians that need to hear this message? In fact, you know, we were doing a meeting, and in this particular Catholic country, while we were there, that all of a sudden, as we started the meeting, that, that, that we had to have a translator that was translating the message into Spanish. And as the translator was going forward, all of a sudden, a backslidden seven Adventist came to the church, did not even know the meetings were going on. They came to the church. The, 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 the woman was married to a, a Catholic, and the Catholic man, his brother, was one of the highest cardinals in the area. He hated Seventh-day Adventists. He was just fussing with her two days before the meeting. He said, I would never join that sect, that foolish church that you, that you once were a part of. I would never accept some Jewish Sabbath. And do you know the, the woman, all of a sudden she came to the meeting. He didn't come, but she came and she said, man, the world is coming to an end. She said, would you please pray for my husband? I want to try to bring him to the meeting. Two days later, she brought him to the meeting. The night that she brought him to the meeting, it was on Revelation, the 13th chapter, explaining the beast, his image, his mark. She began to start cringing now because she said he just said he wouldn't accept nothing. We walked through the Bible, through history. At the very end of the meeting, the man ran up. The man said, I have never heard something like this. And is studying to become a seven-day Adventist right now. My brothers and sisters, God has sincere Christians in every denomination. We better hold fast lest somebody steal our crown. Amen. Now this says, it's very clear, brothers and sisters, in Revelation place. I ask you who but Antichrist would dare and throw himself between two golden cherubims, as if he were seated on the mercy seat of the ark in the place of the glory of God, showing himself that he is God. This is not Christ. This is Antichrist. This is the man of sin. 
My brothers and sisters, this is the papacy. This is the beast system with the Pope at its head. And do you know that right now today, we have Seventh-day Adventists that are telling us that the Roman Catholic Church are not really the beast of Revelation 13. This is one of our articles right here from Adventist today. And this is a, he is a Seventh-day Adventist minister in, 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 in the States. And it says, letting what? Roman Catholics off. Seven reasons for rethinking. He said, you know what? I have seven reasons why the Bible does not really point to Revelation 13 being the Roman Catholic Church. You better understand something. The devil understands this. The devil's trying to shut this church down. He said, here are seven reasons why it may be time to question them in that role. He says, Ellen White finger Catholicism in a very, very different world. Historians have shown that it was a 19th century American anti-Catholicism. He said it wasn't Bible. It was just the country's ideas. That's foolishness. This says, he said, when Catholic immigrants have become our young workforce, why can't we preach the what? Without identifying what? Now, how can you preach the three angels' message without identifying the beast, his image, his mark? One of which says that we must say Babylon is falling. This is part of the everlasting gospel. He says the Roman Catholic Church of today is a much different institution than it was during Ellen White's time. He doesn't remember that Rome says it is the boast of Rome that she never changes. My brothers and sisters, she's only tolerant when she's helpless. But you've been ready to see. Look what the prophet says, testimonies to ministers. Every minister is supposed to know this. Page 117, it says, all need wisdom how? Carefully. And that's what we're doing. To search out the what? Mystery of iniquity that figures so largely in the winding up of this what? Give me another name for the mystery of iniquity. The man of sin. Give me another name for the man of sin. The son of perdition. All right, don't forget that. It says that he figures largely in the wind up of this earth's history that we're going to have to study not casually, but what? Now, we're going to do some careful study. You ready to study? Now, watch. It says he has called them, talking about seven evidence, to not jump in bed with them, but to do what? Expose the wickedness of the man of sin who has made the Sunday law a distinctive power, who has thought to change times and what? So are we supposed to be in an ecumenical movement with the beast, or are we supposed to be exposing the beast? The Bible says that Jesus can't come until the man of sin is what? Revealed. Now watch this now. This says, Romanism is now regarded by Protestants with far greater favor than in what? Former years. It says the opinion is gaining ground that after all, we do not differ so widely upon vital points as has been supposed and that a little concession on our part will bring us into a better understanding with who? Rome. The time was when Protestants placed a high value upon the liberty of conscience which has been so dearly purchased. They taught their what? Now, I always tell this story. Normally, um, students know about what I'm getting ready to say. The, the, I remember one time I was doing a message like this, preparing a meeting, and I had my laptop up, and it was talking about the crisis, and all of a sudden, my daughter walked by and saw me on my laptop, and she saw the picture, and she saw the Pope, and she went over to her, and she says, Daddy! And she stopped me. I looked over at her, and she says, Daddy, the Pope! She was about, she could, she could barely talk. She was probably three years, something like that. She said, Daddy, Pope! And I said, yes, I'm looking. And then she says, Daddy, the man of sin! I said, yes, daughter. <laughs> this says, they taught their children to what? Abhor popery. 